You're listening to The Little Green Cheese, episode 15. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn to make cheese at home. Well, this week I'm going to be talking about soft cheeses. Now, soft cheeses are cheeses that aren't normally pressed in a cheese press, and they're usually pretty quick to make. So let's think of some examples. Some examples that first come to mind, and probably one of the easiest soft cheeses to make, is ricotta. And uh, there are a couple of ways to make ricotta. First is using whole milk, and the other one is to use whey from a... Uh, a, a previously made cheese like a, a cheddar or a, some sort of semi-hard cheese. Pretty easy to make and uh, the recipe's up on the blog littlegreencheese.com so you can pop over there and have a look. Ricotta is basically a, it's, some people call it lemon cheese. You can make it by over acidifying the milk. First of all, you raise the temperature up to about uh, 92 degrees Celsius uh, which is uh, nearly a hundred and sorry two hundred and four Fahrenheit, if I remember rightly, uh, and then you just simply add quarter of a cup of uh, white vinegar or cider vinegar, uh, or a quarter cup of lemon juice, and the milk then curdles and it separates into curds and whey, and basically you strain it and you've got ricotta, uh, or in uh, some parts of the world paneer is another form of uh, acid cheese pretty simple to make. Now, um, some of the other soft cheeses that I've, I've made, uh, cream cheese is another one, uh, and cream cheese is a really good soft cheese. Uh, all you do is bring the milk up to temperature, add the culture, uh, let the culture sit for a little bit, and then you add a few drops of rennet solution. Uh, not a lot, that's for sure. And uh, you leave it then to um, coagulate overnight I think it's between 12 and 18 hours. Uh, and then basically what you do from there is you then strain it through a cheesecloth and leave that for about 12 hours. And lo and behold, you've got cream cheese and you add a little bit of salt to it to preserve it. And you can just store that in the fridge. Pretty simple. Like I said, the recipe for that is also on the littlegreencheese.com blog. You can have a look at that. One of my favourites, really quick, only takes 30 minutes, is obviously quick mozzarella, 30-minute mozzarella. Uh, There's many recipes around the world. Um, I've got a nice simple one on my website. Um, The process is heat the milk up to, um, it's about 30 degrees. Uh, You don't add any cultures or anything like that. You add add a little bit of lipase, which is an enzyme that adds flavour to the milk. Uh, And then basically... You then add the rennet, uh, bring it up to about 40 degrees Celsius, and it coagulates by itself, sets the milk, uh, then you strain it, and the next step is, and I use the microwave. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to use the microwave, but uh, I've got some instructions on the site where you don't need to use the microwave. You just simply heat the whey up a little bit more to a higher temperature. But I prefer the microwave. It's nice and quick. Uh, basically, you um, zap the uh, the milk, uh, sorry, the uh, curds, which are formed and have been drained in a bowl for about a minute at a thousand watt microwave. Uh, you knead that a little bit, get a bit more whey out, and then uh, tip that off, and then two more times for thirty seconds, and then uh, at the end of that, you've got a really hot ball of mozzarella that you can stretch and form into whatever shape you like, and then to finish that off. Basically, all you do is to drop the mozzarella ball or balls. Um, You can make little uh, boccaccini balls and uh, pop them into iced water for about two or three minutes to cool the cheese right down. And that sets and then you can use it within, um, uh, within, as soon as you pull it out of the iced water, I suppose. Certainly um, during cheese making classes that I teach, uh, that's what we do, and people taste it on a nice piece of bread with some uh, tomato and some basil. That's lovely. 
Um, but you can leave that overnight, that mozzarella, and the flavour improves tenfold. It's just amazing. The lipase seems to kick in after a little while, and the cheese tastes amazing. Now, that'll only last for about a week because it starts to destabilise uh, in the fridge, and you, um, you, you do need to, uh, to eat it as quickly as you can. So there are a few really simple soft cheeses that I've made. Uh, another one you could probably classify as a soft cheese would be feta. Uh, it doesn't need a mechanical press, so to speak, um, but you can press it using, I use a two litre milk carton uh, filled with water. So that equates to two kilograms or um, what's that? 4.4 pounds for those in North America. And it's pretty simple. Um, heat the milk. The recipe's on the site. So you heat the milk, um, add a culture, uh, allow that to uh, acidify a little bit, and then add the rennet. You only stir for about 20 minutes, if I remember rightly, after you cut the curd. Um, and then uh, you press a re- press it for about four hours, really lightweight, uh, into a cube, and then you add it to a saturated weighted brine. Uh, and then it's ready to eat the next day. So soft cheeses are usually made with uh, pasteurized milk because they don't have a super heat treatment like some of the uh, harder cheeses that you could get away using raw milk. Um, Only reason I'm saying that is because uh, standards Australia and New Zealand, food standards Australia and New Zealand uh, do not allow you to make soft cheeses out of raw milk for sale. So what you do in your own home is your your, um, prerogative. So um, if you've got a a house cow, then I dare say, uh, and you know it's cleanliness and hygiene, then you won't have too many problems making your own uh, soft cheeses. So basically, most of those cheeses are drained. They're not they're not pressed, as I mentioned, with a mechanical press. So some of the great, um, some of the makeshift items that I've made to drain is I put a uh, it's a, a broom handle. Um, so I wipe that down with a with a vinegar to make sure it's all um, sanitised before I start. So a broom handle between two chairs and just suspend the uh, bag of uh, cheese curds um, on on the pole between two chairs and then put a drip bowl underneath. Um, and we just put that in a room that uh, that is nice and quiet and there's not too many problems with that. And that can drain for, you know, up to 12 hours or, or whatever it needs to drain. Uh, one um, one soft cheese that I forgot to mention that I recently made and produced the latest um, Little Green Cheese video tutorial on is halloumi, a nice simple cheese uh, from milk to finish. It took about four, three and a half to four hours, and there's not much to it really. Pretty simple. I made the recipe up myself from a um, watching a, a video from uh, from YouTube. Uh, there were some uh, ladies from Cyprus. Uh, making this cheese, a, a Greek lady and a, and a Turkish lady. Um, used, they both used the same uh, method uh, to make halloumi, and uh, and it tastes pretty good. It's pretty good indeed. I really enjoy it, um, cooking it in a, a frying pan because halloumi doesn't melt, so you can fry it readily, and uh, the, the flavours just come out. They're just amazing. So, um, yeah, look out for that on the uh, Little Green Cheese blog as well. Uh, freshly... Um, posted video tutorial and I put a copy of the recipe that I created there for free as well. So on with the news. Well today's news is from the United Kingdom. And I found this little gem from the Mail Online, and I really um, can relate to this. And here's the story. It says, The village of Stilton is banned from making cheese that bears its name after officials refused to bend uh, European Union rules. So here's the story. It's, it's not very long, but it's, a, it's quite eye-opening, really. So the village of Stilton has been banned from making its namesake cheese after EU officials ruled it originated in another part of England. Under European law, the renowned blue cheese can only be produced in Leicestershire, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. Controversy arose when the Bells Inn 
within Stilton, Cambridgeshire announced it wished to, wished to name its own blue vein cheese after the village rather than Bell's Blue, which they have been forced to do. So basically, um, the village of Stilton in the United Kingdom can't make uh, the cheese called Stilton. So, uh, And the reason behind that is, back in the uh, ye olde days, is that Stilton, the town of Stilton, was actually a market town. They actually didn't make the cheese in Stilton, and quite rightly, they did make it in those other shires or those other counties. Uh, and uh, by horse and cart, bought the cheese to Stilton and sold it there. So hence the name Stilton. So that's the main reason. Um, and it's quite funny because the other day, um, and this is not part of the news, but uh, the other day I received an email from a uh, uh, a guy in Switzerland. And, uh, and I thought he was telling me off for a minute because he was telling me about... Uh, did I know that uh, Emmentaler was a um, AO, AOC branded cheese, so um, an official name, so nobody else could use it? And basically, I thought he was the cheese police, and to send him an email and uh, and said, "Look, I'm sorry about this. You know, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to take the video down? Do you want me to rename it? That sort of thing." And he goes, "Oh," and then he came back. Uh, about half an hour later via our email, I said, no, 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 I'm not the cheese police. I'm just a, an alpine cheese maker and, and your uh, your recipe is nearly spot on. And uh, so anyway, because um, cause, uh, Emmentaler is uh, under AOC uh, rules or protected designation of origin, uh, I did change the video title to um, how to make Swiss brackets Emmentaler cheese uh, and same as the blog post. So uh, it's just something to watch out for. Those cheese names are actually protected by uh, by rules uh, that govern them. Um, and if you make them for sale, um, just uh, just be careful. Okay, we've got lots and lots of reader feedback this week. Uh, I know it's been about a month since I did a cheese podcast, but in that time... I have been making um, that halloumi cheese making video and making those video tutorials do take up a lot of time. So sorry about that. Sorry if I've been a bit scarce on the podcast front, um, but hopefully you're um, you're quite happy with the YouTube video that I produced on how to make halloumi and the subsequent recipe that I put up there as well. Okay, so listener questions, and I'll just play the first one now. Hey, Gavin. This is Carol from Glasgow in Scotland. Um, loved your podcast on Parmesan, and I was wondering if you would consider doing one for cheddar. I'm new to cheese making and would love to give cheddar a go. Thank you. Bye. Well, thanks very much, Carol. Appreciate the voicemail. Um, I'm not too sure about the reference to the Parmesan. Uh, podcast. I don't think I did a podcast, but I did do a YouTube video. So maybe that's what you're referring to. I actually did do a, uh, there's a couple of cheddar varieties that I did uh, video tutorials for. The first one's Kefili, uh, which is a cheddar style. Um, Another one is Farmhouse Cheddar. I did a a YouTube video for that. uh, And that is another uh, cheddar style. And the last one I can think of is Colby. I know that's a, a US uh, invented cheese. However, it does use the cheddar style as well. Uh, and they all do taste delicious. So pop over to uh, my YouTube channel. Um, you're looking for uh, the username Greening of Gavin, uh, which is my other blog. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, search for um, how to make kefili or something like that. And then uh, you won't have any problems and you'll find them. So thanks very much for your question, Carol. Okay, the next listener question is from Ian. So let's roll that one. Hello, Gavin. My name's Ian. I'm having a few little problems with my uh, camembert as far as drying. it. And uh, my question is, uh, at what temperature do you dry your camemberts? I've, they just seem to have holes everywhere, like the Janolan caves inside. And one other question, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, just the, the temperature of your drying. People tell me that it should only take two days. Well, sometimes it takes me uh, a week, uh, and turning it every second day. Uh, and the other, the other question was, uh, can um, 
the, the maturing uh, temperature. I've been doing it at approximately uh, between 11 to 15 degrees. Is that correct? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ian, for your question. Now, camembert is, uh, like I probably said before, one of the trickier cheeses that I've made. And I've only had a few successes from the, well, probably a handful of times that I've made it. I find it a little bit difficult to make. However, I do know the answers to your questions. The uh, drying time. So draining the cheese, you really need to drain it for at least 24 hours when it's in its moulds itself. So make sure it's well drained. Uh, that way a lot of the whey uh, will uh, leave the cheese and just leave the, the, the curds behind. So once that's done, so when you uh, then uh, dry, you don't actually uh, air dry the cheese per se. It stays moist most of the time. So um, after it's come out of the mould, you uh, salt or brine the cheese um, and uh, you can you can use both methods. So a fully saturated brine is is a really good solution to to salt your camembert. And then basically you put it into the um, uh, into the ripening box that you've you've got that has a little rack on it, and you can seal that up. And you put it into your cheese cave, and you r- allow that to mature at seven degrees Celsius. Uh, higher temperatures will produce um, ammonia type smells um, in that cheese so you really do need to have a fairly low temperature uh, when ripening camembert i hope that's uh, helped answer your question ian and the final uh, listener question uh, voicemail one anyway is from a very polite gentleman called randy uh, from florida in the united states i'll play that one Hello, Mr. Weber. Uh, My name is Randy Adams. I am from Jacksonville, Florida, the United States. I'm a novice just uh, stepping into the world of cheesemaking and have only recently started listening to your podcast. If I may say, I find both your videos and your shows to be a great help in really understanding the craft of cheesemaking, so really thank you for everything that you're doing. It's, It's a privilege to be hearing all this helpful information. My first question is concerned with the cutting of the curds. It seems that in each recipe, regardless of your cutting tools, you cut the curds to a similar size range of about 4 millimeters. Is there any variation in curd size as you go from recipe to recipe, and if so, why? My second question is one based in fear of the cutting the curds too small. Have you in your experience cut the curds to the point where there's just whey and little useless micro curds? Knowing me, I'm just kind of irrationally afraid of wasting a whole batch of milk because I cut for way too long. Anyway, I thank you once again um, for letting, allowing me to ask a question, and I look forward to hearing back from you, sir. Well, thanks very much, Randy. Appreciate it. So curd size. Well, the larger the curd size, the moister the cheese. So you'll find that in recipes like um, Camembert, uh, Stilton, um, so some of the blue cheeses, um, let me think, uh, halloumi, uh, they really do have big curd sizes. So I'm talking about probably half an inch, and that's big um, as far as uh, cutting the curds goes. So they have uh, large curd sizes. When you get down to really hard cheeses that you don't want much weigh in, and there's not much moisture in like Parmesan and um, Swiss or Emmentaler, the, or Romano is another good one, good example. The curd size is really fine. So what I do, I use a uh, balloon whisk, and I don't whisk the curd. I just uh, st- uh, stab the, um, you might have seen in the video, stab the uh, whisk into the curd all the way around, and that makes um, quite fine-sized uh, curd cubes. So they're about, oh, probably about four mils. Now, they will shrink. Actually, um, uh, so to answer your second question, the curd does shrink, okay, as you stir it and heat it up or, or, or maintain it at the target temperature. The, uh, when I was making halloumi the other day, it went from about half-inch cubes or maybe even a little bit bigger cubes, probably a, an inch in some instances where I didn't cut it properly, um, and that went down to about oh, a centimetre or what's that, a quarter of an inch. Okay, that's what the final cube size was. Uh, for cheeses like uh, Parmesan, 
the the size of the of the final curd after you've stirred for an hour or so uh, is a size of a rice grain, so really small curds. So you just got to be careful when you're draining it that you um, you have a a fine cheesecloth to do that. And really, I've never come across a um, a cheese that I couldn't save, and I've never made the curds so small um, that uh, that it didn't turn into cheese. It it, it all does. So um, don't sweat the small stuff. No big issue as far as curd size goes, and really you can't make it too small. But it all depends on you when you initially cut the curd to the size it says in the, in the cheese recipe. So just be uh, prudent of that and uh, make sure you follow those instructions. So that's all of the voicemail uh, reader feedback. I've got some emails here. Uh, okay, so the first one is from, and this one's from Mike, and I'm not sure where Mike's from. Hi, Gavin. Any chance of some advice? I make brie and camembert quite well up to the storage point, normally before wrapping in cheese paper or boxing the wheels are springy with a moist centre. Not sure if that made sense, but it doesn't matter. Um, I'll, I then put them into a fridge that's about 4 to 5 Celsius, but where when I go to retrieve them, they have become harder as if all the moisture has been drained out. So would wrapping in foil make any difference, or can you offer other advice? Also, when Stilton has reached the required time in the maturation box, would you then wrap in foil and fridge to keep? At the moment, I backpack and fridge. Regards, mate, and thanks for all the tips via the website. Okay, so, um, Mike, what I think is happening there, you're missing an important step. Um, after you wrap the cheese in cheese paper, and that's the camembert version, uh, you will need to keep the humidity high. So really you do need a ripening box. Uh, so put it in an airtight container which traps all the moisture and your cheese doesn't dry out. Now as for the Stilton, um, I wouldn't vac pack it because the uh, Penicillium Roque 40 needs oxygen to develop in the cheese. So by vac packing it, you've excluded all the oxygen and you're not going to get the desired effect. You're not going to get blue veins within the cheese uh, and uh, by vacuum packing it, you might even squeeze the cheese a bit and close those holes. So the best way to do that is to wrap the outsides in uh, foil and leave the two ends open, and the ends of where you is where you have pierced uh, with your piercing tool to open those holes so the mould um, can get some oxygen. So that's the best way uh, that I find to make a, uh, a very nice Stilton. Okay, so the next question is from, this one's from another Mike. Now, Mike comes from the UK, if I remember rightly. He says, howdy, how goes the world? Well, the blue mould is growing in place and only on the outside of the cheese, and if I make any more air holes, the wheel will fall apart. I have a thick, velvety blue carpet with high spots sticking out of it, and I've cleared it off a couple of times. Being so thick... I took a core to see how it's going inside. White and virginal with slightly creamy streaks near the coat. Lots of air spaces and voids, but no blue inside. Uh, not even travelling down the coat. Okay, so Mike, I think the solution is, um, as I mentioned in that previous email, is wrap the outsides of the Stilton with foil, leave the ends exposed. Um, not only will that hold your cheese together a little bit, um, it uh, excludes the oxygens from the side, so you don't have to worry about mould growing all over it. The mould will focus its attention into the holes. Um, and by the way, the mould usually takes about two months to grow into the middle of the cheese, so don't be too concerned that it's virginal and white, your words. Um, so, uh, yeah, it probably takes... Uh, I'd try it again at four months. I think the the blue flavour will be permeated all the way through the wheel, which is really what you're after. So hopefully that answers your Stilton question, Mike. Okay, the next one, this one's from Cole. Now, Cole uh, only sent this the other day. He says, Hi, Gavin. My question is, while just now placing the cooked curd of what was planned to be a Parmesan cheese in the mould, it dawns on me that I used the wrong culture. 
I used MO30 Slart 31 Mesophilic. Now, anybody who's read my cheese blog knows that a Parmesan needs thermophilic culture so it can be heated up to the 52 degrees Celsius uh, to make those curds a rice grain size. Now, he goes on to say, so the question is, should I expect uh, what what should I expect to be the outcome and which way should I go with the cheese batch or is it the bin or the dogs for this one cheers Cole well Cole I don't think you need to give that to the dogs um <laughs> what I do think I think you'll end up with an edible cheese sure the culture's being killed off because you've raised it up to 52 degrees Celsius but what I recommend is you still press it and then wax it uh, once it's uh, touch dry and mature it for about a month at 13 degrees Celsius. And look, see what happens. I reckon you'll get a quite a tasty cheese. Um, it'll still be a cheese. Uh, it won't be a Parmesan, unfortunately, because it won't. the thermophilic culture won't kick in and uh, increase the acidity and create those lovely Parmesan flavours we, we're normally used to. But it will be edible and it will be cheese. So try that out. Don't throw it away. Um, really, you um, if you make mistakes like this, no big deal. What have you wasted? Eight litres of milk? No big deal. Lots of cows in the country. So, um, uh, yeah, so away you go. So hopefully wax that and, and you'll be laughing. Okay, the final question is from Lorraine. And Lorraine is from New Zealand. Says, hi Gavin, I just purchased your ebook and I'm going to try your kafili recipe. I will be using four litres of milk, half the recipe, half the quantity in your recipe. This is my first hard cheese, and I would like to know if I need to adjust the amount of weight when pressing, and also whether I need to adjust adjust the amount of time. I've been making cheese for three months and I'm hooked on it. My reason for the smaller quantities is that my husband can't eat dairy. So I'm the only one eating the cheese. Well, Lorraine, thank you very much for your email. Um, look, I believe that it will work if you use half quantities for all the ingredients and that the timings are the same um, and that the uh, pressing weights are the same as well. However, what I really think you should do is make the full recipe, uh, mature it as normal, and basically uh, when it's mature, and it only takes three weeks to mature, cut it in half, Vac pack the rest and put that in the fridge. And then you've got enough for yourself to eat right now. So you've got half a cheese, so that's about 500 grams, uh, or one pound, roughly. Um, and then later on, when you get peckish, you don't have to make another one. You've got another half in the fridge. So uh, try that. Um, if, uh, if not, make the half quantity. But I recommend making the full one kilo because it's yummy once you get uh, get into it. Okay, well, that podcast went a little bit longer than normal, didn't it? I know we had lots of readback, uh, sorry, we had lots of listener feedback and lots of voicemails to get through, and I did ramble a little bit on the soft cheeses, but they are some of my favourites. Soft cheeses are so simple to make, and they only take a few days and you can get stuck into your cheese, your hard-earned cheese, straight away. So lovely. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. There's the outro music. So you can find upcoming cheesemaking courses um, and my cheesemaking ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheesemaking at Home, all available on my uh, website, uh, www.littlegreencheese.com. You can find all of my cheesemaking video tutorials within the ebook uh, or on my YouTube channel. Just search for Greening of Gavin is the username there. So thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows. <laughs>